All right, so in the interest of time, it looks like our participant numbers have slowed down, so we'll get going here. Um, so I'd like to say hello to everybody. I am Melanie Wope, Chair of Alberta Beef Producers. I, along with my family, ranch in the Northeast Zone in Yerba Vallen. Please be aware that we are recording this tonight, and uh, it will be available tomorrow on abpdaily.com. I would like to start by introducing two members of the ABP executive who will also be able to answer questions tonight. First off is Jason Hale. He is our vice chair and he joins us from the Southeast zone where he ranches near Bassano. We also have Brody Hogan, who is our finance chair. He is also from the Southeast zone where he ranches near Orion. We producers have a lot on our plate right now, and I really would like to thank all of you for taking the time to join us tonight. Our intent for this evening is to provide you with an update on the drought situation, but we also want to hear from you. We have two options for engagement if you have questions or comments throughout the evening. You can either submit a question through the question and answer function at the bottom of your screen. Please do not enter it in the chat and we will do our best to answer them as we go. Or you can raise your hand when we call for questions and you'll be unmuted and ask, uh, uh, unmuted to ask your question live. Tonight, I will provide an update on ABP's work with the government to address the needs of producers. You'll also hear from Karen Schmidt, who is our ABP production and ex extension lead and Stacy Domolowski, who is with the Beef Cattle Research Council and they will be speaking on production considerations during the drought. With us from AFSC, we are very pleased to have CEO Daryl Kay. We also have Steve Yance, who is the Chief Client Officer, and Emmett Hanrahan, who is the Vice President of Product Innovation. They will discuss some options available through your insurance coverage. So with that introduction, I'm gonna get started. The ABP executive and staff have been monitoring the conditions across Alberta over the last several weeks as concerns of a widespread drought continued to elevate. Now conditions, uh, as conditions rapidly deteriorated, the Canadian Cattlemen's Association held a meeting with provincial organizations, chairs and managers for a national discussion on disaster relief options to establish industry position but also to provide producer-led solutions. On July 9th, General Manager Brad Dubo and I met with AFSC representatives to clearly communicate that the situation was becoming extremely serious and requ requested, excuse me, that AFSC start communicating op options to livestock and crop producers through their channels. Since then, AFSC has put an additional 121 adjusters in the field. These adjusters are then able to conduct pre-harvest crop assessments. By that, afternoon, Friday, uh, by that afternoon, ABP started to push information to producers about options and contacting municip municipal councillors to make them aware of how their area was being affected. Yesterday, I participated in the Canadian Cattlemen's Association Town Hall. We've been handling a steady flow of media requests and posting up-to-date information, including the CCA Town Hall on abpdaily.com. Hopefully, you've all downloaded your apps on your phone. The Canadian Cattlemen's Association has been working with the Canadian Canola Growers Association and the Grain Growers of Canada to ensure that our sectors can work collaboratively to navigate these drought conditions. This morning, a joint statement went out asking to expedite approvals for insured crops to be designated for livestock feed or grazing purposes. To ensure crop insurance office staff and adjusters can assist with producer requests or questions in a timely manner during this time of urgency. And also, asking for temporary but immediate incentives or preferential treatment under crop insurance to allow insured crops to be grazed or converted to feed without penalty. I would just like to provide a brief timeline of what exactly ABP has been up to. We did begin emphasizing the serious risk of drought to the government at the end of June. 
during a meeting with the Northern Alberta Caucus and the Capital Region Caucus. On July 9th, we sent out news release. Uh, we sent out a news release urging government action and asking producers to reach out to their municipalities. The goal was to make the provincial and federal governments aware of the rapidly deteriorating conditions and to begin to trigger the agri-recovery process. On July 12th, the ABP staff clarified programming options with AFSC to aid in the development of recommendations to the provincial and federal governments. A discussion took place with Alberta Environment and Parks on options to lessen impact for producers grazing on Crown land and opportunities for more forage. These options included ex expediating water approvals on government leases, utilization of vacant Crown lands for grazing or making hay, as well as allowing subletting for unused Crown lands. On July 13th, Jason Hale and I attended the Calgary Stampede Economic Recovery Reception hosted by the Agriculture and Forestry Minister, Devin Dreeshen. Premier Kenny and Minister Dreeshen gave speeches emphasizing their focus on agriculture moving forward and its importance regarding the post-COVID economic recovery that Alberta is facing. We spoke with multiple politicians, their staff, and AFSC representatives regarding the drought situation in the province. Once again, our message was the urgency for a rapid response as the window for converting crops to cattle feed was quickly closing. The next day staff provided informal recommendations to Minister Dreeshen ahead of the federal provincial territorial partnership meeting on July 15th. These recommendations were aligned and put forth federally by the CCA and emphasized prioritizing the full exploration of agri-recovery. They included allow insured crops to be designated for alternative use in a timely manner, provide support for quality access and infrastructure, implement feed need drought assistance programming under agri-recovery, and to immediately announce the list of designated regions for a 2021 livestock tax deferral with a further recommendation of it possibly being carried on for more than one year to give producers the opportunity to restock once conditions approve. On July 14th, I attended a reception hosted by ministers Dreeshen and Bibo. This was a small gathering which allowed for conversation with provincial and federal politicians as well as industry leaders. On July 15th, Alberta did receive verbal commitment from Ottawa that a joint agri-recovery program will be initiated to support the prairie producers affected by these drought conditions. This was especially timely as the possibility of a federal election has been suggested. We have received confirmation that Alberta has submitted the formal request for agri-recovery as well. I hope that gives you a general idea of what's been going on and really how quickly things have been moving. It has been ABP's mission to initiate drought solutions as quickly as possible. I can say that rather than just talking with the government and trying to increase their awareness, we really try to provide solutions that producers had asked for. Unfortunately, we don't have all the answers and we are really asking for your input tonight. ABP will continue our efforts in maintaining a viable industry through these unbelievably tough times, which will likely impact our industry for the next several years. We are absolutely a resilient industry, but we do need some help. Would anybody like to uh, ask any questions at this time? And I cannot see any raised hands or anything else. Caitlin, is there anybody that's got anything? I do have one raised hand, so I will. Uh, where did it go? Nope, looks like they put it down. So I think you're good to let Karen carry on. Oh, they put their hand down. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, oh. All right, then we will. Sorry, I, oh. uh, Laura does have a question from Eric Butters, so I'm just going to unmute her. Sure. 
Go ahead, Laura. I'm not getting anything. The Iowa producers feed grains. Iowa produces more feed grains than all candidate combined. What is, uh, does anyone know what the state of the Iowa crop and the rest of the, the rest of the U.S. Corn Belt is looking like at, in order that we might have a backup supply if we need it? So what I've seen on rural TV, which is kind of our window into what's going on in the U.S., uh, they declared 50% of their agricultural land under um, severe drought, 30% under, I forget what the word they used was extreme drought. So I, I, I haven't heard numbers, but I don't think, I think a large portion of their country is in the same um, boat that we're in. We've heard that the crops in North and South Dakota are done. And recently, actually, Brody uh, uh, gave us a, um, or sent us some information that in parts of Montana, they're not even allowing combustible engines to be on any cropland or pastures because of the risk of fire and there is no ag exemption there. So it's pretty dry. In a not only in this vast area of Canada, but in the United States, it's it's quite large. But I don't know numbers. Does anybody else on the call have yes. a better answer than that? I was just told that estimated <laughs> corn yields are going to be five million bushels. Five million bushels less than last year. So far. Thank you. Thanks. So we've got another question in the Q&A and it is, what about producers that are not in the agri-stability or agri-recovery programs? Maybe somebody from AFSC could answer that for me. Uh, sure, I can, can jump in. The question was specifically about um, Agri stability was it or ag recovery? If producers aren't in, don't you know, have not been a part of agri stability or agri recovery, is there any? So are they eligible now or? Yeah, in terms of an agri recovery response, uh, they you know depending on how that program is structured, they will be eligible now. So um, whether or not they're in agri stability or in an insurance program. Uh, if they're impacted in this situation and an ag recovery program is developed, which we know it is being worked on, then they will be eligible to receive uh, funding under that program. Thanks, Daryl. So we've got a few questions coming in specifically for AFSC. I think we'll get to the um, first presentation and then if we can have AFSC present and then we'll handle those questions after. Sounds good, thank you. So I am going to now introduce Karen Schmidt who is the AVP Production and Extension Lead and Stacy Domolowski with the Beef Cattle Research Council. I believe Karen, you're up first. That's correct, thanks Melanie. I'm just double checking that everyone can see my screen. Perfect. Melanie Nod. Perfect. Excellent. Stacy and I are going to give a bit of an overview of some production considerations and resources that are available in drought situations. So first of all, when we see hot temperatures like we've been seeing over the past few weeks, it's important to recognize that animal requirements for water increase substantially. And in some cases, they, they can actually double for some classes of cattle. So having sufficient water is really important, especially when seasonal sources are drying up, such as seasonal springs, dugouts that don't get a ton of runoff, those types of seasonal water sources. So it's really important to have a backup plan, whether that's pipes, troughs, hauling water, wells, um, even making new developments. Those backup plans are super important to make sure cattle have access to enough water. 
And on that, when we have hot conditions, the evaporation of those water sources, especially in standing water bodies like dugouts, leads to concentrations of certain nutrients that can be harmful to cattle. And especially we'd be concerned about things like sulfates, nitrates, salts, uh, altering the pH of the water source and total dissolved solids. And you can see in the chart to the right, those are for sulfates and and looking at some of those, those concentrations that can be very harmful for cattle. I'm sure that a lot of you probably remember the situation that happened in Saskatchewan a couple of years ago with, with high sulfate water. Another thing that we see in hot, dry conditions is the formation of blue-green algae, which actually isn't algae at all. It's a type of bacteria called cyan cyanobacteria, and it actually produces cyanide as a toxin. And you might see a bit of a shiny sheen on top of a dugout, uh, might kind of look like oil spill or, or paint spill on top of the water. So the, the message that here is really test, test your water. And once you get those results, you can actually enter them into Alberta Agriculture's Rural Water Quality Information Tool, which will let you know if there's anything you really need to watch out for in terms of water sources for your cattle, if there's any contaminants there of severe concern. We also want to look out for some heat stress. If you see cattle panting with an extended neck, maybe drooling, tongue might be hanging out. These are cattle that are in distress. They are too hot. We need to be providing shade. We need to be checking them frequently. We're not moving them in the hottest parts of the day. We're moving them early morning or late, late at night. Again, this is where water access becomes very important to fresh, clean water. And in very extreme cases where, where they're in a lot of distress, the, really the only thing you can do is try and spray them down with some cold water at the hose. And I realize how impractical that sounds when animals are on pasture, but it's really the only option if, if they're in severe distress to try and save them. It is more common in black hided animals, but it is definitely not unique to, to black hides. So you can see it in, in other cattle colors as well. Another consideration when we're in these types of drought situations are poisonous plants. I've listed some there as examples. It's certainly not an exhaustive list. I recommend familiarizing yourself with the poisonous plants that may be in your region. You can check out the Canadian Poisonous Plants Information System as well as stock poisoning plants of Western Canada. Both are available on a Google search. Usually cattle will avoid poisonous plants, but if they're the only thing to eat, they will eat them. And oftentimes they look more appealing in a drought type of situation when forage supplies are low. Providing adequate salt and mineral is a way to uh, entice cattle away from poisonous plants. If you have large patches, you may want to think about mowing or spraying them out, potentially even temporarily fencing cattle out of those areas. And again, it's important to monitor and be able to recognize these plants that can cause death in, in sometimes not very high amounts. Everyone's got supplemental feed on their minds, I'm sure right now. So we're thinking about alternative feeds. We're thinking about byproducts. We're thinking about failed crops. We're thinking about residues. We're looking at what, whatever we can put up in as green feed and silage to get our cattle through this time. And I'd urge you to think not just about cereal crops like barley, wheat, and corn, but think about things like peas, lentils, beans, canola, sugar beets, potatoes, uh, anything that might be growing in your area that you can maybe entice a neighbor to sell to you. Uh, if you're looking at hang ditches, you might want to watch for weeds. Ask about when or if they were last sprayed and with what. And stay away, if you do have flax growers in your area, stay away from green flax. Green flax contains prussic acid, which is actually quite we can think about things like distillers grains, screenings, which you may or may not put into pellets, uh, fruit, veggie, bakery waste, get creative, um, hulls like oat hulls, straw, and some weeds even. Uh, immature Canada thistle, immature kochia, they have quite good feeding values. 
So I think the viability of these really depends on availability in your area, what you might be able to source as well as transport costs. So it's not like these are cheap alternatives in some situations, but they may help you maintain your cow herd through the rest of the summer and fall, depending on how dire this situation gets. With any of these alternative feeds, you need to feed test and you need to get those rations balanced. It's likely that you may be cobbling together a bunch of different sources of alternative feeds. So it's really, really important to balance those rations and understand the nutrition that, that those alternative feeds may be providing. And then you need to match those nutritional um, characteristics of those feeds with the classes of cattle that you're feeding them to. So each class of cattle, whether that be calves or yearlings, mature cows in different stages of gestation or lactation will need different nutrient requirements and you need to make sure you're matching those up. So the first things we're always looking for are energy and protein. A lot of alternative feeds might be a bit lower in energy and protein than what we're used to on good green summer pasture. So we might have to look at supplementing energy or protein or both. We're looking at minerals, we're looking at vitamins, Vitamins that are usually present in green growing grass might be lacking in alternative feeds. If you're sourcing some cereal green feed, you can want to pay particular attention to calcium phosphorus ratio and consider the antagonisms between some of these minerals. So things like copper and moly will interact between with each other and too much molybdenum will actually tie up copper. The same if you've got too much iron and too much sulfur, that can also tie up copper. Sulfur and selenium also interact. So I think there's, there's a lot of uh, potential antagonisms between some of those minerals, which may, may not be meeting the cattle requirements. So it's important to talk to a nutritionist if you're unsure. There can be several anti-nutritional factors in alternative feeds uh, that we're concerned about. And there's a list of those there. Now, one thing we want to be sure that we're keeping in mind is that some of these can have additive effects. So if you have high sulfate water and you're feeding a feed such as say canola with also that could have high sulfur in it, those will have an additive effect. And we need to consider all the sources of some of these anti-nutritional factors that may be present. In addition, um, nitrates can be high in drought stress cereals. So it's something to keep in mind. If you're using screenings, you want to be very, very careful uh, about ergot or any other mycotoxins. And we want to think about dry matter and digestibility. So some alternative feeds may be awfully wet, which means that the rumen won't function properly unless there's a drier source of feed with it. If you're feeding something that's very low digestibility, like straw, Cattle in some, some production scenarios, say uh, cows in late gestation, can't eat enough straw to meet their nutritional requirements and you'll, you'll risk impaction. So generally, a lot of these alternative feeds will probably only make up a portion of the total diet, which is why you might be cobbling together various sources of, of feed to try and make a complete ration. Some other management considerations include combining groups of animals. So you're grazing in a bit higher density to give your other pastures some more recovery time. If we do happen to get some rain that brings those plants out of dormancy, think about creep feeding or early weaning your calves to take some of the pressure off of those pasture resources. Preg check, maybe a little bit earlier than you normally would. Uh, we, can, we may see some heat and nutrition effects on conception rates for next year. So if you've got open cows, get them out of there so you don't have to pay to feed them. Depending on the moisture situation as we head into later summer and potentially even early, early fall, we could look at seeding some annuals to provide some late fall and maybe even winter grazing. Again, not a cheap option, but one to consider if, if you're not interested in, in downsizing your herd. So that is a, it's a question mark right now because we don't know if soil moisture conditions will support that germination of those crops, but we can always cross our fingers. Anthrax can be a concern in hot and dry conditions. And this is because when cattle are overgrazing pastures, uh, they might be consuming more, more dirt and more soil, which is where the anthrax spores are. So if you see any animals with sudden death and you can rule out poisonous plants, don't touch them. 
get a vet out to see if anthrax might be a concern. And last but not least, the most heartbreaking option is obviously destocking to some extent or another. And that has to be, that's a decision that has to be made on individual basis. Last but not least, we want to monitor pasture recovery. Even if we can consider the drought over, uh, it may take some time for the pastures and, and other feed sources to bounce back, uh, even into next spring. So make sure you're monitoring your pastures closely to make sure their recovery is sufficient before you start grazing them again. When you've got equipment out on anything, if you're silaging, if you're trying to hay things, you guys need to have fire extinguishers and water trucks handy. Uh, there's been a ton of squatter fires in, in really hot, dry areas lately, and it's, it's very, very nasty. So make sure you check your fire extinguishers that they're working properly. And also, this is a really stressful time for all of you, for all of us. Wellness supports are available, and don't be afraid to reach out. The best time to plan for a drought are years when there isn't one, and it should be a permanent part of every grazing plan. And so for some resources to help you do that, I'm going to hand it over to Stacy. Hey, thank you very much, Karen. Um, Karen gave a really great overview on some things that you guys can do um, right now to kind of mitigate some of the drought stress that you're seeing. We do have a lot of great resources on our website, beefresearch.ca. Um, you know, the, this widespread of drought is definitely something we're not used to seeing all the time, but we are used to seeing regional droughts and there is um, pretty good evidence of things that do work. And so if you go to our website, beefresearch.ca and type in drought in the search bar at the top, you will bring up a whole bunch of resources here. Karen's just showing a bit of a screen grab, um, all sorts of things around some just general resources, water systems, alternative feeds, a lot of the stuff that Karen has talked about, we kind of dive a little deeper and give a bit more information on that as well. The other thing I would say is make sure that you're subscribed to our blog. Um, we push out new information that way and there is some new resources coming, including um, a calculator on how to think about pricing some of these alternative feeds, because I think that's a big question is if you want to work with your farmer, neighbor or whatnot to graze this, how do I even start the conversation of where to price this? So that stuff's coming. So stay, stay subscribed to our blog. Karen did also mention the need to feed test right now and making sure that your the feed source you're planning on feeding, um, there's there's no serious red flags. The feed test calculator on our website, um, if you go to resources and um, I'm completely blanking on it, um, decision making tools, sorry, there's a feed test calculator on there. This is just a really simple check for your feed. So what you do is when you get that Greek printout sheet that, you know, gives you all these random numbers, how do you interpret it? Um, you can put it into this calculator, as Karen mentioned, the matching it to the class of cattle at the top, the stage of production, put in your general information about it, and it just pulls up this result at the bottom. It's kind of a red light, green light situation. If it's green across the board, that feed is good enough to be the only source of feed you're feeding your cattle. If you're starting to see those red boxes pop up, you need to think about supplementing, blending, that sort of thing. So this is a really useful tool, but keep in mind some of the other things Karen's already mentioned about additive effects and um, some of the sulfur um, and nitrate issues that you might not be seeing on this calculator with some of those alternative feeds you may be considering using. And with that, um, you know, obviously we welcome your questions, but um, we are hosting a free webinar for beef producers on July 29th. We've pulled together a panel of veterinarians, nutritionists, and forage experts that are here for you to ask those questions about, you know, risks of feeding canola, what you need to know about some of these different feed sources that you may not be used to feeding. So. Uh, make sure you write that down and join us for that for your chance to it's it's a free q a with um experts in the field to be able to answer some of those animal production animal health related questions for you and i think that's all we have right karen 
that's it. We'd be happy to answer a few questions. Um, but again, if you are free on the 29th, you'll be able to get specific tailored advice. So that's that's something to stay tuned for. That's really great. Two really good presentations. Thanks. I always say as a veterinarian, we always think we know everything, but I always, always learn something from you guys. So I appreciate it. And these uh, BCRC webinars are fantastic. And, and I, <clears throat> Miles is sitting behind me and he just said, we have to write that down our calendar. So even though I do get the emails. <laughs> so anyway, thanks very much, you guys. Very much appreciate it. Are there any um, questions in regards to this presentation? I know we have quite a few questions for AFSC. We're just going to hang on until we hear from them. Is there anything for Stacy or Karen? I'm not seeing anything for Stacy or Karen, but I've got one from Darlene Bedell okay. um, in regards to our work with the government. So she's asking um, why we're asking the government to ensure feedstock conversion to ranch beef producers, but in 2002, no one enforced the amount per bale. So beef producers had to pay high prices for supply and demand. Who's going to be the watchdog so farmers or crop producers aren't double dipping? Anybody want to take that one? I, I don't have an answer for that. Um, I mean, it is obviously supply and demand as to whether the government would step in as a watchdog. Does anybody else, can anybody else help me out, Brad or? Yeah, I could just, uh, right now we are looking at it more as a free market, but that could be something we look into. Uh, so um, most of the ones we have proposed as of right now have been encouraging um, insured crops to go for um, for feedstuffs. Um, when, if it does come to a pure subsidy, we could definitely take something like that into account. As for who would enforce, I think that would have to be decided at that point. Yeah, well said, Mark. I have nothing more to add. It's going to be challenging, there's no doubt, and I wish we had a better answer for you, Darlene. It's uh, it, it is part of the situation, though, that we are facing right at the moment. You know, I think we're already starting to see that with our hay pricing. It's just going through the roof, if you can even find it. Um, I mean, there's a lot of factors going into that. As I said, the Americans are dry and we're, we're seeing some movement up here into our feed as well as these production contracts, which uh, are kind of holding these, some of these crop producers um, at having to fill their contracts and not being able to convert some of this to feed. So there's a lot of different moving parts for this. And unfortunately, yeah, well, as far as the price, I don't have a good answer for that either. Any more questions or are we going to move on to AFSC? Yep, the other questions I have are specific for AFSC, so we can carry on with them. Perfect, then take it away, AFSC CEO, Daryl Kay. Thank you very much, Melanie. I think I'll ask Caitlin to share her presentation. Sure, so run through these slides fairly quickly. I know we've had a number of questions and I, I just as soon get into some of those questions and, and work with some of the, uh, the producers. So I guess I'll start by thanking uh, you for having us tonight. It's a good opportunity to, to get in front of everyone and have a discussion about, you know, some of the programs that we're trying to work with the government on, talk a bit about adjusting and, and how we're trying to manage that workload. And we know that um, there's, there's certainly an urgent need for us to respond quickly. We know that um, this is an extremely difficult situation and we want to make sure we're trying to, to support producers as much as we can. So, Caitlin, I'll jump into the, the first slide. Um, and just quickly, I know Melanie did mention, but I do have a, a few folks with me tonight. Um, Steve Yons, who's our Chief Client Officer and oversees our adjusting area is here and uh, Ahmed Hanrahan, who, who is our Vice President of Product Innovation but oversees that product development group as well. So 
So I guess the first thing we really want to talk about in stress is, is this discussion about putting crop to another use. Um, we recognize um, in those situations, it's important that we um, producers reach out to uh, an insurance member in our branches um, so that we can do a yield appraisal and, and try to release those acres as soon as we can. Um, so that's the first key point I, I wanted to make. I know we, we talk about um, strips and things like that in, in the case of silage or bale, that really helps us manage the workload because we can come back to that work. So that's pretty important as well. Uh, I do have a slide on adjusting. So I'm gonna talk a bit more of that uh, when I get there. I do wanna address the low yield allowance because this conversation has uh, come up a lot. This is the, the allowance that we have in place um, for that situation where the, where the yield on a crop is extremely low and, and it gives us an opportunity to apply a zero yield um, to those impacted acres. Um, and when we talked a little earlier about, you know, providing some incentive to the crop producers to, to turn that into to feed, that's what we're talking about here. And, and we all know, I think we probably have all heard the Saskatchewan announcement um, late last week that, that talked about um, them doubling their allowance to try to incentivize, you know, more crop producers to, to head down that path. Um, I want, you know, we are having those conversations. We're working very closely with the federal government and the provincial government, made some very good progress today. We certainly understand the urgency. Uh, this decision needs to be made quickly if we are going to move ahead with something. And so I'm hoping that we'll be in a position to perhaps announce something in the next few days. Um, but it is something we're aware of. We know that um, obviously Saskatchewan has made that decision and we're working with the federal government and the provincial government as well. Um, wanted to talk a little bit about variable price benefit because we have had some questions on um, obviously prices have, have gone up significantly. Um, and the variable price benefit is included on, on anyone who's purchased crop insurance, um, whether annual crops or perennial crops. And so um, obviously we've seen some significant price increases uh, as long as those increases are over 10%. Um, what we do on this program is we take an average of prices from, from October and so if any of those producers on either of those programs are in a clean position, it will be paid out at the higher amount. And I know we've talked about the, the pressures around delivering on contracts, forward contracts. And um, so the good news from the variable price benefit perspective is that any claims will be paid out at that higher price. Now it is capped at 50%, which we may um, be bumping into in, in a few cases, but um, but I, you know, I'm, I'm comfortable and confident that that program will help support uh, producers in when they're in a clean position. So we can jump to the next slide, Naomi, or sorry, um, Caitlin. So obviously, the from an adjusting perspective, this is uh, a, a focus of our organization. We do have over 120 adjusters across the province. Uh, we recognize the urgency. We've seen a number of pre-harvest claims come through our offices. We've handled somewhere around 350 to date, um, but we also know those numbers are, are raising and, and coming up rapidly. Um, so number one, I, I wanna talk about priorities because um, obviously we're not treating all claims the same. And the top priority for us right now is those clients looking to uh, um, bring cattle onto the land to graze. And um, so we do need to, to have a, a claims adjuster out to, to look at that crop and, and uh, do a yield assessment as quickly as possible. That's number one. Number two, we're talking about silage and bale crop, baling crops. Obviously we have a little bit of time here in terms of um, if a producer can leave a strip for us to come back to. That way you don't have to wait on any from anyone from AFSC and you can, you can get out there and do your work. Um, we're likely going to see that crop continue to deteriorate anyways and, you know, be in a better claim position uh, if that's the case. So we're asking for strips in those particular examples. We also know there's hail claims out there. We obviously a lighter hail season this year, given the dryness, but um, that would kind of fall under that, that third priority. But really focused right now, making sure we're doing everything we can to support, um, you know, moving that crop into feed. Uh, talk a bit about procedures, because one of the things we've, we've uh, talked about over the last 10 days or so is really cutting down on the procedures that we use and reducing counts. And we've done this before in situations where we had unharvested uh, crops up in the north, for example. But if our, our crop adjuster is, you know, it's pretty evident from the damage that that drought is consistent across the field, um, we're freeing them up to make quicker decisions, reducing counts. 
um, we recognize there's some some areas that are hit uh, pretty hard and, and we don't want to you know continue to, to have to do the same number of procedures so we're freeing up them to, to move really quickly through that so um, that's important as well talked a bit about strips already again that helps us manage their workload um, in terms of, of moving producer or moving adjusters throughout the province again pretty important for us we we've, we've seen a number of our adjusting staff kind of relocate and move down through the south. That's where a lot of the uh, work has been completed to date. Um, and we'll continue to move them around the province. We know that there's pressures in a number of areas now. It's so dry in so many different areas. Um, but we're prepared to move them as quickly as we can to try to address the need. Um, like I said, we know these pre-harvest claims are coming in. I think there are more than 200 between yesterday and today that came through our offices. And so uh, it is our number one priority in terms of trying to respond as quickly as we can. We recognize the urgency and these decisions need to be made quickly. We can jump to the next slide. So just a, a couple comments on some other programs. Obviously, we have a number of lending clients that are going to be impacted by the drought situation. Want them to know that there is relief uh, payment options in place. Um, just have to reach out to their lender, their relationship manager. That can be an interest only payment, um, a full payment deferral, uh, restructure of a loan, reamortization. We want to make sure that we're um, spending the time and working with our producers who have been impacted. So I wanted to, to mention that tonight. Obviously, there are a number of producers that are in the agri stability program. We're looking very closely at interim payments. So any any uh, producers that it's in a decline posi uh, position of at least 30%. We're looking at making sure we're getting those advances and interim payments out um, for producers. So we can jump to the next slide. And finally, egg recovery. Uh, you know, this um, AFSD, I think, has an important role to play in working with the provincial and federal government. We know that the formal request has gone in last week. Um, we know that they're developing what that program will look like. Um, AFSC will likely be called on to deliver that program. Um, and so we're working very closely uh, with those parties to make sure that, you know, we're, you know, we have a unique position um, hearing from producers every day and, and, and understanding that the challenges they face. So we're working very closely with both uh, Alberta Agriculture and the federal government to make sure that the program meets the needs of, of the industry. And so um, not a lot to update from that perspective at this point, other than to say that uh, those conversations are taking place. We know that there's a number of provinces that are impacted. And so this is extremely important. Uh, I give the minister credit. He's pushed very hard for, for this initiative and working with the federal government. And so, so we're hopeful that there'll be um, some movement and some announcements in the very near future on agri recovery. So the last slide really just opening up, um, and I know we do have some questions. Perhaps we can start to get into to those. Um, I believe Emmett may have answered one in the chat already, but um, an opportunity to, to work through some of those right now. Yeah, we've got one from Lori Kinney. She wants to know if the additional adjusters were sent out province wide or if it was just for specific areas. So uh, again, in terms of how we allocate those resources really depends on the hotspots. We have um, allocated probably more to the south than we typically would you know i think we have 15 to 20 in that area we're probably more like 40 down there right now um, but again we're going to try to move really quickly depending on on where the urgent need is um, obviously it, it's you know it's widespread enough that there's going to be challenges throughout the province but we're prepared to continue to try to move uh, resources across the province as we as we need it I have another question from Colin Campbell, and I think Brad might be able to answer that. I'll just remind everyone that you, if you would like to ask a question live, you can raise your hand and I will unmute you. So Colin wants to know what the guidelines regarding deferral of income from the sale of livestock due to drought. Minimum percentage of breeding herd, time frame allowed to defer the income prior to replacing these animals, et cetera. Thanks, Caitlin, and, and thank you, Colin. So last night we were in a meeting with uh, other commodity groups as well as uh, several uh, of our leadership uh, from the Alberta government, including the Minister of Finance, Travis Taves. And, and I brought this up specifically about what were some of the details or what was the conversation around tax deferral. We are, of course, pushing for a multi-year um, 
program that allows producers to be able to cover all classes and be able to restock if need be uh, over, over more than one year. And so uh, the answer was back that they are in agreement with that and they are continuing to work out those details. So uh, as we speak, the, the, this is something that also takes place with CRA. It is not directly under uh, ag, um, the federal ag, ag minister. So it needs to be uh, developed and implemented through CRA. So there are still details to work out, but be assured that the uh, provinces along with the feds are considering what that program is going to look like and they are pushing for a multi-year and hopefully more details to come on it very soon. Um, there is also one more question here from Carol Framart. Um, Caitlin, do you want me to just... I think that's part of an ongoing conversation that Emmett was having with her. So I'm not okay. sure that that needs to be addressed live. I do have another one for um, Karen or Stacy, if they would like to take it. What classes of cattle fare better on alternative feeds? So very generally speaking, um, obviously, it depends on the nutritional composition of that alternative feed, but because the nutritional requirements are generally a bit lower for yearlings and calves, they will generally do better on, on some of these alternative feeds than cows in late gestation or in early lactation. So it's just because those nutrient requirements are so much higher for, for cows in, in, that, in, that, in those instances that some of those alternative feeds without supplementation just won't have enough, enough to them to, to carry those cows through. Thanks, Karen. Any more questions, Caitlin? Yeah, I've had another one come in from Lori Kinney. She wants to know if AFSC wants to mention the direct deposit announcement today. Oh, sure. I think, um, and I'm not sure if, if Steve Yons, you want to provide some details, but um, we, we have introduced at, at long last direct deposit, so we can make payments more quickly. Um, just a matter of producers reaching out to, to offices to kind of set up their banking details and then it'll be seamless for them rather than, than relying on checks. Um, so that's that's in place now. And that was a project we took on about three months ago. It's complete. And so just one more way for us to hopefully respond more quickly in terms of getting money into the hands of producers. Thanks. I've got another one here. Um, it says that their local AFSC office was telling them that if they take their crop insurance today, it will be assessed at today's yield and assumed optimal growing conditions from today onward. To make decent silage, you want to make some meat in the kernels, but a week can make a real difference on these crops under current conditions. If a strip is left, why can it not be assessed like my grain growing neighbors when it is dry and shriveled up? Good question. And then, you know, my understanding is, um, you know, in the case of leaving a strip, I think it would be assessed when we get out to the field to take a look. Um, and this may fall under some of those questions we're hearing about low yield allowance, because I think that may fall under that. Um, I'm not sure if there's something else Emmett or Steve wanted to add on that particular question. Don't have any more to add here, Daryl, but I can take it away and, and get a speak specifically maybe with the, uh, the person that asked the question and then talk to the adjuster that maybe they were talking to. Yeah, I, I, maybe I will address. I think it's good feedback when, we, when you hear directly from some of them. We're trying really hard to make sure that all of our branches have consistent messaging and are treating you know, producers the same. So it's helpful to hear that feedback. 
um, because you know things are changing really quickly and we want to make sure that we're treating um, everyone fairly and equally and so um, we will follow up. Okay, so I was incorrect about Carol's question. Sorry about that. Um, she wants to know, and she says they don't have crop insurance. We have moisture defi deficiency on both our green feed and our pastures. However, that one storm that was over by the weather station put us over. We received no moisture whatsoever and no compensation was received. There's a real pro problem with this program as the rain and the weather is so sporadic. We just received a skiff of rain today for the first time in a month, and I'm sure it will put us over. She's talking a quarter inch today. Due to the ongoing heat and only receiving rain at one weather station, does not do anything for our crops and pastures. Can anything be done about this program? Six millimeters puts us out of a payment position. Yeah, so I did, I did try and answer that a little bit in the chat. And, and unfortunately, like I can sit, certainly un understand the frustration. Um, unfortunately, if you, you know, unless you've got weather stations in every, in every pasture, in every field, in every hay field, then it's really hard to eliminate that, that difference um, that happens. I mean, we've got some several longer term options that we're looking at around, you know, things like personal weather stations or remote sensing. Um, but right at this moment, the technology is just not there yet. So we're reliant on those federal weather stations. And there are some options within the program about choosing more than one weather station and those sorts of things. There's also, um, you can choose various options over the season in terms of the split. So um, I think, uh, Carol, if you wanted, if, if um, we could get your contact details, perhaps we could uh, give you a call to discuss your specific situation. It's sort of a bit hard to address, I guess, in a, in a town hall forum. I'll make sure someone reaches out to Carol in the chat. I see Thanks. Kent Halloweth has his hand up, so I'm just going to give him permission to speak. All right, can you hear me? So I my question, it's kind of a question slash comment in regards to the same being adjusted and if adjusted at optimal yield that day. We're in a situation where our later seeded crops for our feed production use for our cows isn't more than boot high, yet our barley crops are knee high. So is there going to be any leniency on the adjustment of them? Say my my barley crop that now we're going to have to take that could be close to being at coverage, receiving no benefit payout, but we're we're saving the cow herd, but we have absolutely nothing to uh, show for income um, moving down the road. And given the fact that the forecast doesn't show any rain for two weeks. Um, I'm not sure how we can stomach the fact that they're going to say this crop is going to be a 40 bushel crop when it when it probably won't be in two weeks time. Um, realistically, we're looking at probably losing a, a whole slack of cows out of the out of the industry because we can't we can't work with producers on on getting cereal crops put up for feed. And um, guys and cow calf guys still have money to operate. So I'm just wondering about the leniency on that adjustment at that given day to say that this crop is going to be a 40 bushel crop today, but two weeks from now it might be um, a 10 bushel crop if it stays hot with no moisture. Yeah, unfortunately, we, we got do the yield assessment on the day that it's called in or um, gonna be moved over to that alternative use. Um, and we're seeing some grain um, that might have contracts. So they're being asked to continue that to the end uh, by the grain company too. But um, until it's moved over, uh, we're, we're in a position that um, just for the integrity of the programs, what might be in two weeks, um, unfortunately we can't assess that as of today 
And even though we can see the forecast the same as you can, until we get to that level of uh, yield, um, we're not able to change, change the yield and drop it down. Oh, we've got another question in the Q&A from Kim Watchler. She was wondering if someone could repeat the details on proposed changes or requests to expedite water developments on Crown Lease. As well, was it mentioned any proposed changes on haying or grazing lease? I was wondering if Mark could take that one. Uh, yeah, I can. Uh, so yes, so we asked for them to expedite any water approvals. So the TFA is required for any um, uh, uh, upgrades to your water infrastructure on a uh, on crown land. We asked for that to be expedited, uh, expedited or um, prioritized to make sure that it can happen. You know, especially in the southeast where there is infrastructure issues, that we need that now so that forage can be properly utilized. So we pushed for that, and then as well as hang. Um, so we did ask for both on vacant crown and for leases that. Um, uh, you can hay uh, that uh, that that be made available to members of the public and that policy is streamlined so that could happen just so we aren't leaving forage on the table and making sure that we are utilizing all that we can um, as well as uh, as Mel said the subletting or other livestock we're making sure that if there is leases or um, dispositions that aren't being used this year that um, policy that says that you can't sublet isn't standing in the way of uh, individuals' ability to maintain their operation. So we've got a question in the Q&A from Tim Smith. Can AFSC be involved with a fair pricing mechanism for feed pricing or evaluation of feed tonnage or appropriate pricing? Let me ask Emmett to step in. It's a little difficult in our role to, to get involved in some of those situations, market conditions, market situations. Um, Emmett, maybe you have some. I'm actually not 100% sure, Darrell. I understand the, the question. I, yeah, I'm looking forward to Tim able to comment on it. We'll see if we can get Tim to type up some clarification in the Q&A and just move on to another one for now in the interest of time. So Lottie would like to know, is there any way that the movement of adjusters to after a crop producer and beef producer have made arrangements to use the crop for forage? It seems it is very focused on moving adjusters around and no focus on the immediate removal of these crops in some areas. These plants are going downhill nutritionally by the day and the usual supplies of commodities are not available. So in those situations, um, or like all the situations is the client that has that uh, field, they can call into the office and say they're planning to uh, like a pre-harvest on that. And if the plan is to move it to a silage or to bale it, they can leave strips behind and get that crop taken off right away. So I'm not sure um, how that, the way that question was worded, because that is available, that you can get that crop taken off right away, leave the strips, and then we'll get a team member out there as soon as possible. If it's going to be used for um, pasture, where you're going to put the cattle out on it, then we'll get out there right away uh, before the, the cattle let it, get let out on that field to be able to do the yield assessment. But based on that question, it looks like it's going to be turned to silage or or cut and bailed, and in that situation, then the, um, the person that owns the, that field can leave the strips for us. Thank you. Tim offered some clarification saying third party sales are often hard to negotiate. Can AFSC assist with common pricing mechanism or evaluation? That would be a difficult space for us to get into. Um, I mean, I, if, if it's a question of providing resources on how to negotiate prices, I, I don't know what we would have to offer there. Um, 
yeah, I, I'm not 100% sure, Daryl. Do you have any? No, it's you know it's certainly something we can take away, but it, yeah. Other than providing some information, uh, yeah, I I don't know how we would um, get involved in the pricing mechanism and and um, insert ourselves into that process. It, um, you know, we're very focused on production, very focused on on providing that information, but in terms of pricing, um, it, it's a little more difficult. It, it would be hard for us if the intention would be for us to, to sort of somehow broker a deal between two people, that would be a pretty difficult thing for us to, to get involved in, I would think. Then you three will need a law degree, I think, to do that. Yeah. <laughs> right. yeah. I think it gets tough when we start talking about, you know, mark, uh, free market like we have here. It's, I think that's that putting you in kind of a tough position. Yeah. I see a lot added on to his question there. So he just said, okay, thanks. I guess the producer are unaware of this. So I would encourage anyone on this call, if you are working with um, a straight crop producer and you're negotiating and, and planning to take that off is have them call into the office, any AFSC office right away, and they can work through the details on um, the steps to take for them to be able to, to move forward on that. So have yeah. the person that field call in right away and, and we can work with them and get this move forward for you. And I think there was a reference to us moving adjusters around. I can assure you there's adjusters in every branch office in across the province. So although we're allocating some to some of the, the, the more urgent need, uh, there are adjusters in, in every branch across the province that can respond to those requests. So. So if you guys are good to take a few more questions, I'll just keep reading until someone tells me to stop. <laughs> um, Cohen Campbell says, as a lot of the trouble is attributed to heat, would it be possible to include temperatures in the moisture def deficiency program in the future? It's, uh, that's, a really, um, that's a really good idea. I mean, we, we have talked about that more with um, when we're sort of discussing using personal weather stations at MDI and, and you can get, you know, both a soil, tense, uh, soil temperature probe as well as, as air temperature. So it's something that we can, we can certainly take away. Um, yeah. Jim would like to know if you can request to leave a strip till the crop is ready to harvest and take the actual yield at that time. We'll take the yield as soon as you're ready to move it to that alternative use. So we like to do those very close. If we can't get out there, and the reality is if you move it to alternative use and uh, we come uh, a week later and that's deteriorated, then we'll take the yield at that time, which will likely work in, in, the, in the farmer's um, advantage, um, being it'll be lower at that time than what they were able to take it off at and would lead to a more of a payment. Excellent, so we've just got one last question here from Andrew. Said AFSC waived premiums for Hail Rider last year because they were flooded out. Any chance you're waiving premiums for forages, forages and lack of moisture? It's the extreme opposite this year. Uh, I guess from the perspective you know, the hail rebates we did last year were pretty clearly the crop was no longer viable. And um, we had sold some of that insurance, um, but very quickly realized that there was no crop to insure. Uh, in those instances, I, I think um, having hail insurance without, without a crop, it made, us, made sense for us to, to refund that, that and rebate that premium. I think on the forward side, I think, you know, those programs will pay. I mean, there's premiums that were, were paid up front and if they're in a claim position, the program will respond and, and, and really act the way it should and, and pay out that claim. So is there anything I missed, Emmett, or you wanted to add? Oh, I, th I think you covered that, Daryl. Yeah, it was for the unseated, unseated acres that they had the hail coverage on, because there's about 500,000 um, insured acres that were not put to, because they unharvested, never got seeded. So if they had taken the hail on those unseated acres was where we reimbursed them. That looks like all the questions 
Thank you very much, AFSC, for being here and answering those questions. Uh, I just want to reiterate how uh, good AFSC was for us to work with. Um, Brad and I asked for a meeting with them and we got it within hours and things have been moving very rapidly. So I just want to thank you for everything that you, you guys have done. I know it's been a rough week. Um, I would also like to thank everybody on the call here for attending this evening. If you have any other questions or comments, you can reach out to your elected ABP delegates or to the ABP office. Um, this is also, I realize, a, a very stressful time for farmers and ranchers. We're experiencing it ourselves up here in the north. If you'd like, we'd like to remind you that there's a lot of resources available. If you need to speak with someone, please reach out if you need some help. Uh, we're, I mean, a lot of us are in the same boat and, and we need to look out for each other. So um, I'd like to thank everybody again and hope you have a good evening and remember to, uh, to go on to abpdaily.com or else to look at your ABP app on your phone for uh, any upcoming news that we've got and daily updates. Uh, and like I said, if you had any questions, please feel free to reach out. Thanks again.